And uh, welcome back for the link. We are uh, going to be starting a new series today on the sacraments. Uh, and we're going to be doing that for the entire season of Lent. And today we're going to be starting off with the, uh, the, the entry, if you will, uh, baptism. So over the, um, let me just start off with uh, a little reflection. Over the, the last several months, uh, I've been tempted to start tracking how I use my time, okay? Because I, uh, like I, I started thinking and wondering to myself, how, what, what do I do with most of my time? What am I, what am I usually doing? If I'm not in church and at liturgy or preparing sermons, what else am I doing um, with my time? And what I realized was that a great amount of my time was dedicated, when I meet with people in particular, was dedicated to dealing with relationship stuff, okay? Um, oftentimes, conversations will go like this. Someone will call me up or text me and say, Abuna, I need to meet. And I say, what's going on? They said, well, I need, I need to meet for confession. And I say, okay, let's meet up for confession. Meet me at the church at this time. And they show up and we sit down, pray, have a seat uh, down in the chapel. And... Um, They'll say, I say, so, so what's going on? They say, well, I actually, I just need some spiritual advice. And I'm like, okay, so what's going on? They said, well, you know, there's this guy or there's this girl. And I'm like, it went from confession to spiritual advice to relationship stuff. I, felt, I feel oftentimes that I get, I get hoodwinked when that happens, right? People show up, they're like thinking about the relationship. I'm thinking they're thinking about the relationship with God, but they're oftentimes thinking about uh, other relationship. Kids, you can come on in, grab a seat. Um, grab a seat, you guys are gonna be with us for the, the link. Yep, just grab a seat up here if you will. That way when we break for uh, the discussion section, you guys will have your own little section. Julie, if you wanna sit with the youth, you'll uh, be facilitating their discussion uh, afterwards in the link, okay? Yeah. All right, so welcome to our youth this morning. All right, so the reason I share that is because most times we think, most of the time, what we're thinking about is relationship, yeah? Whether it's relationship with the opposite sex or it's relationship with God, I would say in a respect, there, there's a lot of parallels that are there. And this morning as we speak about baptism, I think there's a boatload of parallels between relationship with God and relationship with the opposite sex. First step, um, when we talk about baptism, we're speaking specifically about that first step of initiating our life in Christ. And what I want to suggest is that the first step of initiating our relationship with Christ is not just simply filling out a contact card. Okay? It's not filling out a card and dropping it in the back. back. It's not attending one of our discovery courses. Uh, it's not giving financially to a church. I would say that it's not even reading the Bible or praying a prayer. All of those things are helpful and important, I believe, and show a commitment and a desire to explore a relationship with Christ. But I kind of would look at those things as almost like flirting with God, okay? That's like us flirting. So filling out a contact card, that's us asking someone for their number, okay? You see someone cute and you ask them for the number. Attending a course, a discovery course, is you reading up on a book about relationships, okay? Um, reading your Bible, that's showing some interest in wanting to get to know something about the other person. And praying a, pay, a prayer is like us picking up the phone when the person finally calls us or I've been told it's not okay, you're not supposed to apparently call someone these days, you're supposed to text them, okay? Someone actually told me this past week that they, went, they were like on one of these dating sites, someone got, one of the people got their phone number and texted them and then the next day called them and when she answered, she's like, uh, what, what do, you, what do you need? Why are you calling me, okay? So apparently you're not supposed to call anymore, you text and and then who knows what happens. I don't know if the relationship remains virtual or not, but who knows, okay? 
But those are kind of like, <clears throat> if you will, that's all those things. That's not yet a relationship. That shows interest. That shows commitment. That shows some desire to have a relationship. But that is not the same thing as having a relationship. Okay? I would say they're very, very important things for us to do. But they themselves are not the relationship. Okay? So today as we talk about the first of the seven sacraments, baptism, I would say that the place that this all starts for us Anyone who's been baptized, thinking about being baptized, and if we look back on how the early church did it in particular, before a person was baptized, there was a choice that was made, either by the adult being baptized or by the parents who were baptizing their children. Okay, There was a choice that came at a certain point to follow him or to dedicate one's child to the Lord. And we find this throughout the Old Testament. We find this throughout the New Testament. You find time and time again, people had to make a choice, a commitment to walk with Christ. Now for those of us, which is the vast majority of us, who were baptized as young kids, there comes a stage in our life where as we pass into adulthood, usually around the age of 12 or 13 years old, that we should have made a decision, a commitment ourselves to choose that this is no longer faith of mommy and daddy, but this is my faith. I am choosing to take my relationship with Christ seriously. And at one point in the church, there was this rite that existed, R-I-T-E, that existed where parents would, with the priest would bring their kids before the altar and the child themselves or the, young, the, the child entering into adulthood would now take responsibility for their own relationship with Christ. They would do a short certain elements of the baptismal rite, like the renunciation of Satan, the acceptance of Christ, the confession of the creed, and now they would say, I believe. This is no longer simply my parents' faith. This is now my faith. I am dedicating myself. I'm choosing to follow Christ. At this point, what if, if we can now say, if, if you were being baptized today, if you were being baptized today, you would say, I am choosing to follow Christ. And what would happen at this stage is your name would be enrolled. Your name would be enrolled into a book called the Book of Life, usually at the start of Lent. Okay? And that imagery and that language, obviously, we find in the Book of Revelation, where those who are committed to Christ their names are written in the book of life. And that would usually happen, since most people were baptized during the season of Lent, that would usually happen at the beginning, right at the beginning of Lent. The understanding was that it was an escape from darkness to light, that we are saying we are fleeing from death to life, and we are signing up for this. We are choosing Him. What we're saying is that we come to Christ because we confess that there is no salvation apart from him. The relationship equivalency is the engagement. It's when the guy comes to the gal and usually gets down on his knee. Nowadays, it's big deal. And there's videographers and families there. And it becomes like a social media event, all that kind of stuff. But usually what happens is the guy gets down, some aspect of it, guy gets down on his knee and pops the question, will you marry me? And the gal, hopefully, if he's lucky, will say yes. Okay? And this is, this is the start of, now you are planning for the, the, this whole next period. Usually by this point, you know if you want to spend the rest of your life, at least for those of us who have gone through this process here in the States, you know by this point, I want to spend the rest of my life with this person, and I'm working towards marriage at this point. And so when a person pops the question, if you will, they're now training and getting ready for marriage. And for the person who has been popped the question by Christ and accepts that, they're enrolling their names and saying, I choose Christ, and for the next 40 days, they go through this process called catechesis. Okay? Catechesis is just 
a big churchy word that means being trained. Being trained in the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Okay? And then the big day arrives. The big day arrives, and any bride and groom, I would say, this is one of, if not the most exciting day of their life. Uh, this is the day that most of us, uh, and I know especially young women, young girls, begin to dream of since they are very small. The day that they will walk down that aisle and get married. But I would say that it's equally a day that we as men and women, we celebrate and we look forward to. So this is the big day it arrives, and for us that big day, when we're wed and united to our Savior, is the day of our baptism. Okay? Now, it's on that day that Christ himself, if you remember in the book of Ephesians, the husband is instructed to cleanse and to wash his wife with the word, just as Christ did to the church. And this is what happens to us on the day of our baptism, is that we are being cleansed and washed by the pure word himself, by being united to him. Okay? You can see the imagery, the parallel. A husband and a wife are united together. Their relationship is consummated by their union in Christ and their union together as one body, one flesh. But our relationship with God is consummated on the day of our baptism where we are united with him in that baptismal font. That big day when it arrives, this is, it all begins, it all begins just as any other thing that we do in the church begins with, which is the prayer of thanksgiving. We cannot start this day without first saying, God, we thank you for everything. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you are. We thank you that you accept us, that you forgive us, that you wash us, that you do all these things to us. And it's that same prayer we pray in, and we start every service and prayer in the church. I want to talk about the four readings that we go through that day. The first one is the Pauline epistle. And this is St. Paul to Titus. He says the following. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So we're saying that salvation has appeared in Christ and that through his appearing, he teaches us to do some important things. Number one, he teaches us to deny ungodliness and unrighteousness, right? So he's saying we, when he comes to us, he says, I'm teaching you to stop doing certain things. And on the flip side, that we should begin doing certain things. That we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And then if you skip down to the very last line there, it says, according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So baptism we understand as a sacrament, as something that is a mystery, that is salvific, and that's the way the early church understood it. It wasn't simply something that we do as an outward sign to reflect an aspect of obedience to Christ because it's what he told us to do. No, the way the early church understood it was that it is through the washing of regeneration, that we are regenerated, that we are renewed by water and spirit, just as he tells, our Lord tells Nicodemus in John chapter 2. The next reading is 1 John chapter 5. This is the Catholic epistle. And in verse 7 and 8, it says, There are three that testify. This is the testimony of what we have, okay? The testimony is the spirit, the water, and the blood, okay? The spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. And that testimony, whether it's spirit, it's water, or blood, the testimony is that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Okay? So for us, we understand when we are baptized, we do so because we are putting on Christ. We become actually, we enter into him. And if we are in him, there's no condemnation. There's, there's no death. We have received or we receive eternal life so long as we are in Christ and remain there. Then the next reading is the Acts. Acts chapter 8, it's an interaction between Paul, sorry, Philip rather, and the Ethiopian eunuch. Paul said, Philip said rather, 
sorry, Paul's on my mind. <laughs> Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. So we understand that there's an importance. We don't come simply to be baptized for other reasons. But he's saying that if we believe in Christ, you may. And the question was, what's preventing me from being baptized? If one wants to be baptized, what's preventing them? He says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded, Philip commands the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized them. St. Cyril of Jerusalem. He's a uh, bishop in the city of Jerusalem in the 4th century. He saw that a group of people were coming to church to be baptized because it was becoming a popular thing to do. And some people were coming because they had business opportunities. Some people were coming simply because they wanted to get married and someone in the church they wanted to get married to and others for other reasons. And he said to them, listen, regardless of the reason you came, regardless of what reason you came for, understand that you are now here and that your life belongs to Christ. Choose him. Choose him. Okay? That's how he begins his first of the 22 letters where he preaches to catechumens, people that are saying, I want to be baptized. And then comes the fourth and the final of the, the readings, which is the gospel. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we are baptized because we want to unite ourselves to Christ so that we would have eternal life. And then the, but earlier, earlier in that passage, in John chapter 3, John 3.16, everyone knows this is probably one of the most quoted, if you just go to a football game or, or a sports game, you'll see the numbers 316, right? You'll sometimes see uh, football players with the black tape right here in, the, in white or white, 316, okay? But earlier in the chapter, in cha uh, John 3, verse 5, Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. My apologies, it said Nicodemus in chapter 2 is chapter 3. Okay? So, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, some of you are saying, but there's some really nice people that I know, and what happens to them? And all I'm saying to you is, these are not my words, these are the words of Jesus, okay? He's not saying, do this because it feels good, do this because it's nice, do this because uh, it's symbolic, do this because of anything. He's saying, unless if you are born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God, okay? Some people say, but in the book of Acts, it said this and did this. I'm telling you, these are the words of Jesus himself. If you want to take it up with him in the second, after the second coming, feel free. These are his words, okay? Baptism was not a small thing. It wasn't a symbolic thing. It wasn't just something that we do because it's something fun to do. So much so, by the way, that if a, an infant is baptized in the ICU and they come out, parents come and say, now can you baptize my child for real? And the priest is like, what? We already baptized your child for real. Child's been baptized. Child has been baptized, okay? Baptism is something that one receives to be born again. And you can be born once from your mother, but you can only be born once also by water and spirit, okay? So those are the readings, and then we move on. The next thing after that is the creed. A lot of people say, like, what is going on in, in baptism? That's why I'm going through it with you guys right now, okay? So after that, we then confess the creed. And the importance of the creed, and you'll find the creed actually in all of the uh, sacramental prayers, is because having a correct faith, the early church believed it was important. So the person comes forward and says, I confess that this is the true faith. I confess that this is the true faith. And that faith that they confess is the faith of the 4th century as they understood who the Holy Trinity, who Christ is, what he has done according to the scriptures in what is known as the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. After the creed, we begin the liturgy of the water where we sanctify the water with what's referred to as the oil of gladness. The oil of gladness. It's a oil that's referenced several times in the Old Testament. And this is... This is 
uh, something that we also find in Hebrews chapter 1. It says, God has anointed you with the oil of gladness. And this is the prayer that we pray when we anoint someone with the oil of gladness. Every adverse power be brought to nothing. Every evil spirit be retrained and rendered helpless. What more joyous and gladdening thing could you and I receive than to have victory and power over the attacks of the enemy? We then move on to a prayer called the anaphora. And the anaphora is a Greek word that means to lift up. To lift up. Okay? And this beautiful image of this child lifting their eyes up, lifting their heart up in prayer as rain comes pouring down, grace comes pouring down like rain, if you will. I thought it was a very beautiful image of this next prayer. We lift up our, pro our eyes to you, O Lord. Who created heaven and earth? All the adornments. Who created the waters above the heaven? You've broken the head of the dragon in the waters. You made a path for the waters. This imagery of the path for the waters comes from where? Moses. Moses, good. You made a path for the waters. You looked upon the waters of the Red Sea. And through the fear of you, you made them stand still and Israel to cross. And by Moses... You baptize them all. Which is language that the church in its liturgical prayer here adopts from 1 Peter. You commanded the hard rock and it brought water from your people for your people and the bitter waters you've changed into sweet waters. We're basically in this prayer right here we are we're confessing and proclaiming the awesomeness of God. We're saying we lift up our eyes and our hearts to you, God, because there is no one that is awesome like you. And as unclean we may think we are or feel that we are at time, if God is as awesome as all the things that we said in this prayer, he is able to exceedingly and abundantly do beyond what we could ever imagine and cleanse us and purify us from any uncleanliness that we have. We then, at this point, turn to a really important part that becomes a... All of this, by the way, the priest is praying all these prayers, doing things to the person, anointing, and all, all other sorts of things. Then we come to a really important part where there's this radical shift in what happens in the prayer. And there's this changing of allegiances that, that occurs at this point. Okay? This is probably one of the oldest parts of the entire baptismal prayer. And you'll find it written in some second century text that you can read today. We begin this part with an exorcism prayer. An exorcism prayer. So all of us, by the way, have had an exorcism performed on us. That's not just the stuff that you see in movies or on YouTube or anything like that. That was something that happened to each of us. And what we're confessing here is, in this exorcism, is that we are involved in a spiritual war. Today we read Matthew chapter 4 in the Gospel reading, right? And what that's an acknowledgement of is that just as Christ entered into the wilderness to battle with the devil, we too are entering into the world to battle with the devil. And so this exorcism is literally the power of God coming upon us and casting away any work of the enemy. Man is restored as a free and capable being to live in true freedom in Christ. We then do two very, or three very important things. The first is we renounce Satan. We renounce Satan. We look towards the West, we lift up our hands, and I want you to imagine this now. You, your allegiance is now over here in the world to the enemy, the devil, Satan. And you're looking at him and you lift up your hands just as you would if you were going to get in a fight. You would lift up your hands like this, right? And you renounce me, say, I renounce you and all your evil works and all your despicable armies and all your hypocrisy. I renounce you, I renounce you, I renounce you. And I've shared this with you guys in the past, but I'll share it for those who have not heard it before. One of the things that one of our, the other Orthodox churches do is that the priest at this point, I don't think they actually literally spit, but the priest will not say, now spit on Satan, and they'll, and they'll pretend to spit at him, right? 
And it's this act of tyranny where you're saying, I reject you, Satan. Okay? There's nothing more treacherous and disgusting that you can do than to spit on a person. And that's what we're saying to Satan. We're saying, you're filth, you have nothing, you have nothing to do with me. And I reject everything about you. And by the way, this is something that we, in a sense, do every morning when we wake up and we face towards the east. We are turning our back on Satan. We bend down, do a matanya, a prostration, stand up, and we begin by aligning our lives with Christ, turning our back on Satan. Okay? This imagery of east and west, it's Semitic imagery, west being darkness, the place where the sun sets, east being light where the, the sun rises. Okay? So we oftentimes look to, to how God created nature and use that imagery to remind ourselves through the rhythm of life that Christ himself is coming, that our allegiance is to the true light, Jesus Christ. And so at this point, we turn towards the east, we drop our hands in an act of surrender. We lower our hands and we say, I accept you, Christ. I accept you. I'm yours. I'm yours. I do. I belong to you, Lord. I love you. I'm yours. You're mine. I have eyes for nobody else but you, Christ. I can't imagine another person or anything else drawing me away from you. You are the love of my life. We then confess our faith in a personal declaration where you say, I believe who he is. I believe in the Father. I believe in the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Faith is always personal, by the way. Yes, there is a communal aspect in faith where we say we believe. But the I believe, the you, your personal faith, is critical. It's not enough to say this was the faith of my parents or this was the faith of the community. The faith is your personal faith as well. You say, I accept you and I believe in you, Christ. And we basically promise to commit ourselves to God till death do us part, although even the grave can't separate us from Christ. It's for all of eternity. We're linked to him and bound to him. So that's kind of the, the, the baptism, if you will. We then enter into the baptismal water. We are baptized three times in the name of, or baptized, but we're, we're submerged rather three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The traditional baptism days were these four days that you find up there on the screen. The first was the resurrection feast or Easter. The second was Theophany, which is in August. The third, sorry, Theophany is in January, my apologies. The third is Transfiguration, which is in August. And the fourth is Baptism Sunday, which is the sixth Sunday of Lent. And it's the day we read John chapter nine, the opening of the eyes of the blind man, okay? So those are traditionally the four days of baptism historically. Um, and most of the baptisms were done during the, 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 the Lent, and there was 40 days of fasting that came before. Lent, for those of us who have been baptized, which is almost all of us here, Lent is our time to recommit and celebrate our own baptism. Okay? Lent is not just a time that we change diet, change food. It's we are saying, Lord, I'm committing and recommitting myself to everything that I began in my own baptismal journey. In, uh, there's a, a first century document called the Didache. Um, and it's just a Greek word that means teaching. Okay? And it's referred to as the teaching of the 12th. It's a 16 chapter document, not too long, but this is the seventh chapter. It says the, the, um, the apostles understood this was the way that they baptized. It says, baptize this way, having first said all these things, so you understand that there's a prayer that occurred already, okay? He's saying, now that you've said all these things, you've said the, the, the baptismal prayers, baptize into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in living water. Living water is just like a stream, okay? It's water that moves. But if you have no living water, baptize into other water. And if you cannot do so in cold water, do so in warm. Why cold water? We had a discussion about this um, during our last discovery course. Why, why cold water? Yes, what do you think? Because um, if they're baptizing a lot of people at once, they won't get 
it won't. Okay, that's a good good thought. But there's a different reason. Okay. Cold water shocks, that's what I actually thought the first time I was asked the question. I was like, that's great, like cold water shocks you. It's like the Holy Spirit shocking you, but that's actually not it. Yes, Jermaine. Isn't typically like the source of where water like, comes from, like the closer to the source of the water running is usually the coldest spot? Okay, and why is that important? Yes. Because it's, you are being buried in the baptism, so it's cold, it's, it's like you're being buried into the ground and it's cold. All of these good reasons are great reasons, but the early Christians were much more practical than any of you, okay? The early Christians, they said, why cold water? Because sedentary and diseases spread in warm water, okay? You won't have diseases as much in cold water, right? So it was for very practical reasons so that people wouldn't get sick, okay? So just some fun facts there. But if you have neither, pour out water three times upon the head in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But before the baptism, let the baptizer fast and the baptized, and whoever else can, but you shall order the baptized to fast one or two days before. Okay, so a few things are happening here. Baptize first, name of the Father, God bless you, name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If possible, baptize in living water, like in a stream, if that's not possible. In a basin with cold water, if that's not possible, use warm. If that's not possible, then sprinkle water three times in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? So you have these uh, important uh, accommodations that are offered. Like someone asked me, like, what do you do with an elderly person or an IC or NICU baby if they can't be baptized, okay? You sprinkle water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? So it's an accommodation that's given, importantly, for the, the, the purpose and the sake of um, practical needs of the people. And a very important thing it says here, but before baptism, let the baptizer fast and the baptized and whoever else can, but the person being baptized should fast one to two days. And what they're talking about here, fast one to, two day, two, one to two days, is not just, it's literally don't eat for one to two days, okay? It's the same thing. We're simply saying, Lord, I am hungry for you. I am fasting. I, I want more of you, okay? So this is uh, a little bit about some probably the earliest uh, recorded document outside of the, the scripture, outside of the Bible, uh, that records some of the practices that you find in baptism. Now in Romans chapter 6, and we're, we're just wrapping up here, we're going to get through this last part quickly so we have some time for discussion. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 4, it says, Do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? If you are baptized into Christ Jesus, you are baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Okay? So we are buried with Christ through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. Right? So the parallel is what? Christ was buried, we are buried. Christ is raised, we walk in newness of life. Okay? That a life in Christ, in baptism, is evidenced by a newness of life. Because that's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That we are to grow into the image of Jesus Christ. Prince Vladimir, a, uh, a Russian uh, prince from the 11th century, he was known to have these really crazy wild parties before he became a Christian. And the 11th century he came around the year 10, somewhere in the mid 1040s, he came to believe uh, in Christ and was baptized and he put off all of the wild parties, the orgies, the money that he used to spend uh, on wars, um, all of the, the prostitution that was around his, his uh, kingdom, all that's of his life and the entire kingdom ends up being transformed as a result and renewed as a result of his own renewal in Christ. Okay? So his own renewal ends up not only impacting himself, but others in the kingdom, which was really powerful. Baptism, my friends, is not, baptism is not just a symbol. Baptism is not something that we simply do as an act of obedience or a pub public de declaration 
or a step towards membership in a local church. One website says, baptism is a symbol. It's meant to show the world that you love, trust, and have put your hope in Christ. It's like a wedding ring. And I would say, no, it's not like a wedding ring. A uh, red ribbon that we put on the person after their baptism, that's like a wedding ring. Okay? But baptism is literally us being united to Jesus. It's us being buried with him and raised from the dead. It is our regeneration. Baptism for us is union with God. Baptism is participating in the life of Christ. It's that reason that St. Paul in Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Baptism is our regeneration. It's our genesis, if you will. It's our being recreated. 2 Corinthians 5.17, whoever's in Christ is a new creation. All things pass away. Baptism for us is integration into the people of God, into the living body of Christ. It's the first step into the life of Christ. Baptism is us receiving the grace of sonship. If you guys remember a few weeks ago in the Gospel Sermon, Joe was talking about why the Scripture speaks about sonship rather than childhood. And he spoke about because sonship, to receive the sonship in, in those days, a son received a different inheritance than a daughter. A daughter received a partial inheritance from the father. The son received the full inheritance. And so for all of us, we receive the sonship, ladies, and gentlemen, by the way, we also are all the bride of Christ. Okay? So there's equal opportunity there for everyone to be a little bit uncomfortable with, with the language, okay? But we receive the grace of sonship. We receive the heavenly inheritance. That's the reason why early Christians, disciples of Jesus, baptized infants. You find it in Acts chapter 10, verse 47. Cornelius and his entire household were baptized. Lydia and the whole household in Acts 16. Acts 18, the guard of the prison at Philippi and all his, all his relatives, the household of Stephanus in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And a really beautiful, important text, Irenaeus. If you guys remember, Irenaeus is a disciple of a guy named Polycarp, who's a disciple of a guy by the name of anyone? John, John the Beloved, right? So you have John, who has a disciple named Polycarp, who has a disciple named Irenaeus. So we're talking pretty close after Jesus, okay? And this is what Irenaeus says, For Christ came to save all babies in the breast, infants, children, youth, and the age. All of them are reborn in him and become truly children of God. The question that some people ask is, don't I need to understand first? Don't I need to understand first? And what I would say is that true understanding is made possible by baptism, not the other way around. True understanding is a result and fruit rather than a condition of baptism. St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the 4th century says the following. He had 22 lectures that he delivered to people that wanted to be baptized. 18 of them, I believe, 17, 18 of them, were delivered before baptism. And then the rest were ba delivered after baptism. Why? Because he said, listen, there's some things you just won't understand without the grace of God. You just can't. You can't. Okay? I'm not saying that seeking to understand is not important, but we shouldn't... How, like, I, I'm always fascinated when people say, if you want to be baptized, you have to go through a three-year course to be baptized. And I'm like, for, for, for what? Three -year, for sure, my friends, there are things that we should know and that we accept about the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity... What, what is in the creed, put clearly, okay? Who Christ is, what he has done for us. But, forgive me, we, our life journey will be a journey of knowing God. And that's, what etern that's how Jesus describes eternal life. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, to know the one true God. We will continue to grow in understanding and knowledge of God for all of eternity. 
So let me wrap up here with one final part for you. What does it mean for us? If we, if we look at baptism as our own union to God, our entering into a life in Christ, our own laying down our lives to be crucified with Christ, to be buried with him, to be raised again with him, then what does it mean for us to let go of our allegiances and the things that hold us back? And I'm just going to give you three aspects. Number one is letting go means that we stop striving and we start abiding in Christ. We stop striving and we start abiding in Christ. Okay? We stop constantly chasing after control and things in our life and we simply stop. If you will, Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. We stop striving and start abiding in Christ. And that's really tough for us to do today. <laughs> because we are constantly, constantly moving and driven and distracted by so many things. The second thing is that we confess and surrender our need for control. Confess and surrender our need for control. Every one of us, by the way, struggles with this in some point. Parents, we struggle as parents in control of our own lives and our children's lives sometimes. And acknowledging that we don't have control. Okay? Kids, sometimes you look around and you say, I don't have control of my life, but I'm trying to get control. And I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. And where am I going to go to school next? And what am I, how am I going to pass this class? And what are, how am I ever going to get control of my life? When are my parents going to finally let go? And I think whether you're a parent or a kid or somewhere in between, we all need to acknowledge that ultimately the one who we want to let go control of, two, is God himself. And number three is to cast all our cares upon God. First Peter chapter 5, verse 17, St. Peter tells us, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. He's the one who we unite ourselves to him. I want to wrap up with one final story. A couple days ago, I was talking to a friend, and he was telling me that um, his wife, his wife doesn't go to the bank. And uh, I was confused by it. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, uh, your, wait, your wife goes to the bank? I'm like, absolutely. She has the ATM. She has a credit card. She, I was like, I don't know, I don't know what she buys. And he, goes, he goes, really? He goes, no, my wife, she, she doesn't like doing that. She w prefers to come and dip her hand into my pocket and take money, f cash from my pocket. And at first I thought, that's really odd. And I was like, that, that would drive me crazy. Okay? But he, the, the imagery really struck me. He's, he said, he, I, I thought about how it is that we oftentimes, we want to have from God our own credit card, our own cash, everything. And that imagery, and I'm not, folks, I'm not suggesting what you do at home with your husbands and wives, with your, all that kind of stuff. But the imagery I thought was beautiful. That this wife, wants to constantly dip her hand into her husband's pocket to take from what she believes is the head of the house. And for me, I want to adopt that, not in my house with my wife, please go to the bank, okay? But I want to adopt that in my own relationship with Christ. I want to constantly be dipping in to what I received in the day of my baptism to my own union with God, to always be coming back to him and saying, you know what? I, I can't go far apart from you, God. I, I don't, I could try it on my own, but I want to come to you as my source. I want to come to you as my head. I want to come to you as my Lord. I want to come to you as my Savior. All right? All right, let's, uh, let's close with that. Um, we have a few questions. I have a few questions for you guys. Uh, this morning.